Okay, hello everybody. I, I believe it's about time to start, right? Uh, thanks for coming to this talk. If I'm not speaking loud enough or if you don't understand or if you disagree, please feel free to interrupt me at any time. Uh, so this will be something like a cr crossover talk between uh, a microkernel dev room, which has, has been organized uh, by by us or somebody else from the microkernel community for several years here, and the the Risk Five hardware stuff. So let me just briefly speak about myself. So I'm a, I'm an operating system guy. I would say I'm a microkernel guy. I have been working on the development of Helen OS. For many years, uh, I have been working on a formal verification of Helen OS uh, as part of my research employment at Charles University in Prague. And uh, quite recently, I have switched to industry. I'm working on microkernels at Huawei. So what the hell is Helen OS? If you don't know, Helen OS is uh, an open source, general purpose, multi-platform, microkernel multi-server operating system <laughs> designed and implemented from scratch. So these are, you know, the buzzwords. Uh, very quickly, it's not a Linux distribution or a BSD clone or something like that. It's our own microkernel design, our own user space built on top of it. Have a look on the, on the website if you are interested. Uh, it's an open source project, obviously, otherwise I wouldn't be even speaking here. Uh, we are not targeting embedded, we are not targeting real time, we are not targeting servers, we are not targeting desktops, we are targeting everything. So it's a general purpose operating system and uh, somehow we have this tradition of you know implementing uh, you know rather in the breadth first manner than than depth first manner. We support these hardware architectures, I would say we support them properly. So we really try to make the, the code base very portable. Only about, I would say, 5% of, of the source code, of the size of the source code is platform dependent. Otherwise, the, everything is platform independent. And this is the reason why I'm talking about the RISC, RISC V and porting Helen West to RISC V. The multi-server keyword means that it's a microkernel, so the kernel component is small. It just does what, what the kernel should should do, and the, the user space cannot. But also the uh, the, the, arc, the software architecture of the user space is very modular, very fine grained. So we don't have huge monolithic components even in in user space. We have very small components, and each each of the component is doing just one thing. And we have some guiding principles that we base our, our software architecture on. Again, if you are interested, please ask me offline, and I will, I will be more than happy to explain to you in detail. So, so reserve like, like five, six hours for that. <laughs> Uh, this is a screenshot. Uh, originally, I feared that I was, would not be able to connect my laptop to this, to this magic uh, uh, casting uh, box, but I can even show you show you uh, actual demo. So, so this is uh, this is not on Risk Five. This is Helenos running on on uh, x86 or AMD64. Uh, so do you you get a normal bootloader. Now the the microkernel is booting, and this is all the user space environment. Uh, so you you can see that it's relatively feature rich. We have our own graphical user interface. Uh, you can you can move windows. You can you can make you can rotate them. If I find the right right, uh, you can resize them. I don't I don't remember. Oh yeah, you can rotate them and stuff like that. There are already something like 45 tasks or processes already running. So, so each individual device driver is running as a separate process in user space. That, that's the microkernel design principle. We have a networking stack. Well, obviously we are not there yet. Because as you can see, this is our web, web browser. <laughs> Beautiful, but I mean, at least the networking is working. So this was a short demo, and let's get to to interesting stuff. 
uh, what is our goal? I mean, generally speaking, it's about dependability. It's about creating a software architecture on the system level that will that would provide you know safety, security, and other guarantees uh, for building dependable software. So, so the architecture, as I have already described, it, the fine-grained components that are isolated from each other. Uh, this, this is basically limiting the blast radius, as it is called. So, so if, ever, if, in, if something goes wrong in a monolithic system like Linux kernel, if there is a, a null point, pointer dereference in a, in, a, in a device driver, you know, the whole system goes, goes out of the window. In our case, only just the, just the single task, just the driver goes out of the window, and there are potential mechanisms that how this could be, you know, solved at, at runtime. It can be also also solved at uh, design time. So, so you can apply formal verification techniques to make sure that actually there is no null pointer difference in any of these components. Formal verification techniques are generic. They could be applied on any code base. But you know the monolithic nature, the monolithic architecture of, say, Linux or, or most of the BSD systems makes it hard to uh, actually practically apply the formal verification methods because the code base is simply too large. In our case, you have these individual separate components and you can verify them piece by piece. So this is, this is the way. We also try to, be, try, to try to write clean, understandable source code. So our uh, comment ratio is 38%, which is probably nice. I mean, again, these are not very surprising ideas. It's about putting all the software engineering bits and pieces together. So having a good software architecture, having, having a good implementation, doing the verification, and having a good development process. And, uh, you know, ocean liners have been built like this for, for hundreds of years. You don't want to have a single single hull of your ship that is carrying, I don't know, 10,000 people because a single iceberg can just destroy it. You want to have this, these you know, watertight bulkheads uh, so that it really, needs, it really requires a huge error and a huge iceberg to sink your ship, but not, not a tiny one. I mean, obviously, there is, there is no silver bullet, but you can do things better than just have a monolithic design. Uh, this this picture summarizes it <laughs> nicely, I would say. Uh, these slides are more or less for your reference. If you would like to go go into it uh, further, I understand it's not really readable at this size. Uh, so this is this is uh, these are the functional blocks in our microkernel. The only thing I would like to stress here is this hardware abstraction layers. So we have this uh, really, even, even inside the microkernel, which is like the, the smallest indivisible component, we have some internal structure still. So, so we have some parts of the code that are, that are platform dependent, that needs to be adapted when, when we port LNOS to a new, new platform. But most of the code base, even of the microkernel, is independent on the target platform. And this is just very simplistic view of the user space. So there is, there is the microkernel at, at the, the bottom, and then we have a naming service, a loader, a task monitor, and init. These are more or less still you know, very critical services. They are in the trusted computing base. And then we build gradually less and less trusted services on top of them, such as the the file system stack, the device driver stack, the networking stack, and, and so on. By the way, our networking stack is also decomponentized, so it's not a huge TCP, IP, everything library, but there are individual tasks, individual applications that take care for, for the transport layer, for the, for the link layer, for the physical layer. Okay, so that was Generally speaking, about Helen OS, and you are probably interested in in, in our Risk Five port because this is a Risk Five dev room. So, so I did some initial experimentation 
uh, in 2016, uh, I, I had a talk about this uh, on, in the microkernel development for them at, at that time. So initially, if you remember 2016, uh, the privileged ISA specification of risk five was in the version of 1.7. There was no upstream tool change support, so, so no GCC, no bin utils upstream support. Uh, and the, the only usable emulator or platform was Spike. So it took, took me something like 18 hours to get uh, some basic functionality. So, so, so to get set up the, the, the infrastructure, you know, create the, the directory structure for, for the platform dependent parts, uh, implement our own bootloader. I, I just did not like the, uh, the BBL, so I implemented my own, and then some initial virtual memory management setup and kernel handoff. Uh, some observations from, from this, uh, there were many things purely, uh, very badly documented at that time. So, so uh, many things like the ABI or, or the, uh, the, the IO interface in Spike needed to be basically reverse engineered from, from the source, co source code of the tools and of, of the emulator. Some other details were still sketchy, like the memory consistency model at that time. But I mean, generally speaking, the, the architecture, from my experience with other architectures, looked nice, maybe except the, the strange compressed page protection fields. If you still remember from, from that version of the, of the privilege ISA, there, there, were, there weren't individual fields in the, in the page table entries for read, user read, kernel read, and stuff, or su supervisor read, write, and execute, but there, there was this strange combined compressed field. I mean, why not? I mean, it just slightly complicated our macros for that. Uh, but our abstraction was fit to it, but it was just strange. So then I, I have uh, I have find I have found time some time to get to it back in 2017, when I implemented uh, uh, the basic kernel functionality as we call it. So basically everything that the kernel needs to to actually work and hand over. Uh, the control to user space, meaning uh, exception handling, context switching, atomic operations, and some basic I.O. So the ISA privileged ISA specification moved to the version 1.10, which I believe is still the, the most current one. Uh, so there were some small improvements. For example, they have removed those strange compressed page protection fields. The only usable emulator at that time was still Spike. And, uh, you know, the, the HTAF IF input device is a horrible design. I mean, really, I, I cannot imagine how somebody could have come with such a, such a strange input device because it has no interrupts, which is more or less understandable. There, there, is, there, there is no platform interrupt controller defined in this specification. But... If you, if you do what you are supposed to do, so you pull the device, you basically send a command to it asking, is there a character available? And if, if no, uh, you, you don't get, a, you know, you know, you don't get a, a zero reply or something like no character available. The, the request gets buffered. So, I mean, just think about it. How, how would you normally pull this device other, uh, in other way than periodically pulling it? But how do you get rid of these this buffered requests when there is no character in, on the input? I mean, it, it, this is just a memory leak on, on the emulator side. So I don't know. So uh, the, the point is, or maybe the moral of the story is that there, there was still no reference platform, some, something, some, some decent specification of the platform, except the CPU itself, that would you know, provide some reasonable basic debugging I.O., some platform interrupt controller and stuff like that. And yeah, I mean, if, if you are porting to uh, something where the GCC toolchain has been just upstreamed, you might encounter uh, internal compiler errors from time to time. This, I mean, this just happens. I'm not blaming anybody. 
this this was fixed in on the, in the next release of, of GCC. And honestly, I, I did not even spend much time, you know, find, you know, debugging the compiler bug. I just, I just, you know, removed the, the the piece of the code that was causing this bug, waited for for an update of the compiler, and then then it worked. I'm not a compiler expert, so it would it would probably, it would have took took me, it would have taken me a lot of time. So and now. I finally got some time to get back to it. So this is what I've been doing for like eight hours this January. So I decided to switch to the QMO Vert platform, which somehow is, according to my opinion, more reasonable than, than what the Spike is providing because you have, you have the platform uh, interrupt controller, con controller there. You have a normal UART uh, serial I/O there. You can use you can use Vert I/O for networking and stuff like that. So so this finally looks like a decent platform to to support, and the tool chain everything is already upstream. So th th this looks pretty usable right now. Okay. So what what are the lessons learned from this very brief experience? Uh, first. There was surprisingly very little interest in porting Helen OS to Risk Five. Of course, you might say this is because nobody cares about Helen OS. But I mean, if you compare it to our previous porting efforts to ARM, Spark V9, Spark V8, other platforms, there was always a, lo a lot of interest. I would say so. So either in the framework of Google Summer of Code or in the framework of Master, master Thesis, there were people, students who would e who would eagerly take Helen OS and port it to a new platform. And there was, um, I mean, no interest with respect to RISC-V. So, so, I mean, the only thing I, that was done was done by me in my very, very, very precious uh, free time. I, I, and I'm an RISC-V enthusiast, but I just don't have the time to do it. So what, what are the reasons? I, I believe that there are two. First, like I've already said, there is still no nice reference platform that would actually provide, you know, interesting features, more interesting than a serial console. So, I mean, obviously people nowadays are not interested in, in, in seeing Hello World from a serial console. They want to have HDMI, they want to have USB, they want to have networking, stuff like that. And that would be easier to achieve if there would be actually an easily accessible, I mean, co cost a, a development board that, that would provide those features. So something like a Raspberry Pi for RISC-V with, with a powerful enough RISC-V CPU supporting the super supervisor mode and for a reasonable price. Yes, of course, you can have a Sci-5 board for, I don't know, 1,000. Uh, dollars, but I mean, that that's too expensive. So once th this is solved, I w I would say that uh, it could be generalized that the Risk Five would uh, get much more attention and adoption by by hobbyists, by students, by researchers, because they just need to. Uh, you know, it, it's really hard to explain even to your boss that uh, this. This hello world printout took you like two weeks of porting or coding. And uh, th there's one other thing. Yes, and so th this, uh, this is something I would like to spend the rest of my talks speaking about. That uh, there has been very little, according to my opinion, input from the operating system guys to do risk five specification. And therefore, from this point of view, from a point of view of, uh, of a microkernel operating system, RISC-V does not bring anything new to the table, which is a pity because how many times, how, how many opportunities in your lifetime do you get to come up with a new instruction set architecture that might actually get some you know, industrial traction, that might actually be adopted by, by, by the big players? 
How many times do you get the chance? So why do why do I think this is this is uh, something that Risk Five might focus more on? Uh, the, the microkernel idea I have spoken about, you know, this you know, fine grain components, isolation, blast radius limitation. This is definitely not a new idea. It has been around since at least uh, the end of 1960s. And it has actual benefits for safety, security, dependability. The, let, me, let me just skip to, to this slide. Uh, most of the benefits were so far somewhat uh, questionable because there were more or less just qualitative benefits. But now there, there's uh, actual quantitative proof that these benefits of the microkernel design is is there that the, or that the benefits are there? So, so there has been there, ha, there have been there has been a study published uh, at a peer-reviewed scientific conference, which which basically uh, analyzed uh, uh, some critical vulnerabilities in Linux and examined them uh, how they would have been mitigated or prevented by microkernel-based design and. Uh, you can hear, you can read here. Uh, Forty percent of those vulnerabilities would be completely eliminated by an operating system designed based on a verified microkernel, such as SCL4 in this case. So, I mean, there are huge benefits of having a proper software architecture on the system level. And obviously, this is not. This is not. Uh, this is for a price. So the, the price that you that you, we pay for for these benefits is the performance overhead. There, there has been a huge effort in the last 25 years to make this performance overhead as small as possible. I mean, the whole uh, the, the 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 whole effort of the L4 uh, L4 people in various projects was to make this this overhead as small as possible but the overhead is still there because for example if you would like to if you would like to run a single uh, file system related operation such as open file or read read uh, block of a file in a in a microkernel multi server design you need to talk to some location or naming service then you need to talk to uh, to a virtual file system service, then you need to talk to the file system driver, then potentially this file system driver will, will forward you to, to a block device driver and so on. So, so you have this, this overhead of the, of the IPC between those isolated components. I mean, the isolation has its cost. And the question is whether it has to be like that. Uh, I, s I believe that the, the cost is being caused by the fact that the CPUs have been designed so far just with the monolithic operating systems in mind. And again, I'm not blaming anybody. I mean, it is more or less natural because, you know, designing a new CPU or instruction set architecture used to be a very complex task. Uh, it, it, it used to be very expensive uh, and uh, people naturally you know, designed the new CPUs according to the requirements for the old CPUs and then the operating system guys were just, fa were just facing with, with what they got and I mean the, the monolithic design was performing much better on it. So let's switch the gears or let's reverse the process uh, let's try to design the, the CPUs with uh, the requirements of the microkernels in mind so that the, the CPU will be able to provide abstractions or instructions or me mechanisms that will help the microkernels perform as nicely as the monolith monolithic kernels while keeping all the nice safety and security features. And uh, I will present a few ideas. Uh, I won't go into too much details because first we don't have the time and second, uh, I mean, I, I would probably rather spark a discussion than present something I, I'm, I'm sure is going to work. 
but these are a few ideas. So, for example, we would like to optimize the, the IPC itself. Where's, where's the problem? In a monolithic system, if one subsystem is calling into a different subsystem, all it does is a normal function call. So, so there is a, some passing of arguments in registers or on stack. Uh, and the code is free to, to pass point, direct pointers to data structures. So, so this, is, this is efficient and also unsecure because of all, all the reasons we have already discussed. In a microkernel multi-server design, you need to do the IPC, which means that you have to call some kernel syscalls, which will, will pass some arguments uh, in registers again, but the, the, the set of registers you are allowed to use is naturally somewhat limited. There is the, the privilege level switch, the address space switch between those two components. If, if the IPC is asynchronous, there is some scheduling involved. And uh, if bulk data needs to be transferred, the data needs to be copied between the other spaces, or there needs to be some memory sharing established. So where the CPU could actually help? I mean, why not, why not design an extended jump or call instructions, and of course also return instructions, that would actually also do the address space switch? So, so imagine something like a call gate, which would be basically like a calling capability that would identify the target address space and the target program counter of the, of the server IPC handler. And this could be implemented on the hardware level, for example, like, like a cache, something like a TLB, TLB cache, cache structure, which will be populated by, by the microkernel. So again, the microkernel will be fully in charge, on, or, or, uh, in, in, uh, will be fully in charge of deciding which, you know, which client can call which server. But for for the most frequent calls, this the mechanism will will be streamlined streamlined by the hardware. So so uh, the context switching and and address space switching will be done by the hardware. For, for the asynchronous IPC where, where there is the, the need to somehow buffer the, the, the payload of the message, uh, this could be also streamlined by the hardware, by, by using cache lines as, as the buffers. So the, the data would not even need to go to, to, the, to the main memory. Yeah, sorry. How is this different from just pinning your microkernel on one CPU core and running your applications on some other CPU cores? Well, I mean, I'm not saying it's different. I'm saying it goes uh, beyond what has been done. Again, these ideas are not, not floating in the air. These ideas are more or less based on the optimization techniques that has, has been done uh, by, by you know, the microkernel developers over the past 25 years, where they actually try to, use, to squeeze you know, as much CPU cycles from, from, the, from, 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 the, from the cores as possible. But, I mean, my point is that if the CPU would be more helpful or would provide more, optim more you know, space for optimization, the, the, the overhead might be even lower or maybe ideally zero. So, I mean, I'm not saying it's different. I'm saying, it, I mean, we are talking about the same direction, but let's think about actual hardware mechanisms to make, them, make this more optimal. And you know, generally speaking, pinning pinning uh, workloads to cores is possible, but uh, we would also like to have efficient cross-core IPC. Okay, what about the bulk data? So, so again, this is not such a great issue nowadays because many microkernels, such as Helen OS, implement memory sharing to to efficiently transfer large amounts of data between the other spaces. The problem is that this uh, memory sharing needs to be established. And if this establishment and possibly the teardown of, of this is happening too often, this causes the overhead. And also the data needs to be page aligned, which is, is a minor, minor trouble. So again, how about uh, uh, having an additional memory mapping mechanism in the CPU that would allow uh, 
for example, to do fine-grained mapping from, from virtual addresses to cache lines directly. So cache lines are pretty small, something like 64 or 128 bytes. So this would be ideal for the sharing of, uh, you know, smaller data structures, ad hoc sharing of data structures between the other spaces. What about the, con the problem of the context switching? Uh, uh, again, this is, uh, I mean, most of the CP optimizations, again, in, in the recent years, have been targeting the problem of, uh, of uh, hardware latencies. So we have, we have, uh, we have caches to, to hide uh, nanosecond latencies of, of, the, of the DRAM. We have software caches, like, you know, I/O buffers to hide, hide uh, millisecond latencies of of, uh, of uh, disk drives and SSDs. But what about the the microsecond latencies of of the context switching? There there, there are there are op mechanisms to 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 solve this, like hardware multithreading, which is very eff uh, effective in doing that. But uh, you know. Usually, in current CPUs, you have just a fixed number of hardware, hardware threads. And uh, you have to use so software-based context switching to have more. So how about finding or designing a mechanism that would combine the benefits of both? So something like hardware, uh, hardware cache for, for thread contexts that would scale to a reasonable amount of contexts. Uh, and dedicate instructions to store, restore, and switch those contexts. This could be possibly optimized for, for the ABI, because you don't necessarily need to save all the, all the registers in all cases. And it would also help uh, with, uh, uh, if, for example, if combined with some autonomous mechanisms, for example, triggering the context switch by some some event like an external interrupt, this could this could uh, again eliminate the round trip to the to the kernel, and doing the context switch in software. Obviously, we need to be careful because we don't want to implement some kind of kind of hardware scheduler or hardware scheduling policy. That this would be probably disastrous. So again, we would just like to have the mechanism in the hardware, but let it be controlled by the software. And if combined with, uh, with uh, some kind of uh, simultaneous multi-threading, multi this could very efficiently even you know, ma you know, mask the, the nanosecond latencies like on the caches and parts of the, of the, of the cores. User space interrupt processing. If we have user space device drivers in a microkernel-based operating system, we always uh, have this uh, unpleasant round trip to the kernel where each interrupt needs to be first handled by, by the kernel space. Then the kernel space generates some IPC message which is then forwarded to, uh, to the user space, user space driver. Why? There could be a mechanism to directly deliver the, uh, the event to, to the user space device driver. Of course, there's, there's the normal pain point of level tricked interrupts. Uh, but again, I believe there, there are ways how this could be handled by, for example, automatically masking the interrupt source in the, in the platform interrupt controller in those cases. And this would you know, not only lower the, the overhead of having device drivers in user space, but it might also you know, finally fix the single remaining architecture flaw of current microkernels meaning that there still need to be some device drivers in the kernel space, for example, the, the driver for the timer. With this, the, tri the, the timer driver could be pushed out from, from the microkernel. And even the scheduler could be completely pushed out of the, out of the microkernel. With just a little help from the CPU. Okay, uh, final topic, I won't spend too much time on it uh, because I, I, honestly I, I don't have very, very clear ideas how this could be done. But uh, uh, think about RISC-V 128-bit architecture. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe that 
having 128 bit flight pointers is very useful. Maybe for some 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 situations, but I wouldn't say that this is it's it's such a huge address space that there is no practical use for it. But what about dividing logically the pointers into 64 bit object identifiers or object capabilities in, in the parlance of microkernels and 64 bit offsets that would uh, allow the hardware to do very very efficient bound checking to to make sure that that uh, the the objects uh, that, that the only only the owners of the objects have access to them and stuff like that uh, Maybe in this particular case, this won't help the microkernel so much because the microkernel capabilities are more about resource management than you know physical bound checking. But this could be also useful, or maybe even more useful for some managed, managed languages VMs because they wouldn't have to implement uh, the the bound checking in software, but there, there will be a hardware mechanism for that. Okay, so these were just some ideas uh, to convince you that this is not just a total wet dream. There have been there has been some prior work that somehow points in, into this this direction. So, for example, there is this paper from 2005 that evaluated offloading some microkernel operations to to uh, hardware. They have implemented uh, uh, some modifications to a FPGA-based soft core. And the evaluation is uh, uh, that uh, there is something like 15 to 27 percent performance improvement. And this was based on, on offloading, I would say, coarse grain uh, functions such as threat creation to the hardware. I'm talking about much finer grained uh, ideas here. And yeah, hardware message passing has been actually implemented in in some hardware devices so why not push it into the mainstream regarding uh, uh, you know the hardware support for for different address spaces uh, many of you have probably seen this paper about the, the space jump uh, uh, programming model which showed on on the barrelfish uh, uh, Baltic kernel and on, on Dragonfly BSD that this could be useful for different kinds of applications for, for example data centric applications and you know if you are as old as I am you might remember the task state segment on AI32 which was kind of a hardware context switching mechanism I mean it actually still is in, in that chip that most of us have in our laptops. Uh, uh, and it was actually even used by Linux, uh, and uh, the, the performance was not, not poor. I mean, it was, it was quite comparable with, uh, with the software-based mechanism at that time. And the reason why it was removed uh, from the code base was uh, because of portability. So, so different reasons than performance. So may, maybe there is still good chance to revisit this, uh, this idea again. Uh, about the, uh, the cross address space uh, calls, again there, there is a, a prior R that has been actually available in most, most of the x86 uh, chips that we have, which is called VM functions, which is basically the very same idea. So that uh, there is a way how to how to make efficient calls from one VM in, in the in the VTX uh, uh, domain to another another VM, and exa exactly there are some some fix, there is some fixed number of entries that that could be used so far, and it has been shown by some of my colleagues that uh, this. Uh, could be really used to, you know, take a monolithic binary, like I don't know, a web server with with an SSL library, and split it into very fine-grained components. I'm really speaking about very fine-grained components, like individual functions, and put them into 
into separate VMs. So, so for example, the, the business logic of the web server would be would stay in the original VM, and the encryption and the cryptographic key management would be pushed out to a different VM, and connect them using this VM function instruction. And uh, the cost of of this separation is comparable to a single syscall. So it's not not terribly bad for performance. And again, this is just misusing a mechanism that hasn't hasn't been designed for for the purpose I have talking I have been talking about. So what about a mechanism that would be specifically designed to help microkernels? So I'm looking forward to a new paper about the skybridge mechanism of my colleagues that sh should appear at Eurosys in a few months. Uh, about the capabilities, I mean, there, there's not much, but there is this, again, this paper about uh, hardware-based, uh, uh, basically, bound checking, which was implemented on as an extension to the 64-bit MIPS ISA where there were basically 32-bit bound registers or capability registers which contained you know, the information where an object boundary is and this was checked by the hardware. Uh, again, the performance evaluated on a, on a FPGA software was very nice. The limitation in this case was the inflexible design. If this would be done in more flexible, let's say, thanks to the fact that we could have 128-bit pointers, so, so so we wouldn't have to have dedicated bound or capability registers, but the, the, the bound will be encoded in, in the pointer itself. Why not use it? And actually, Intel MPX is also more or less in the same direction. Okay, so that's probably all for me, so uh, I might work on RISC-V uh, port of uh, Helen OS in the future, but if you are interested, feel free to, to, to drop me a, a message. But I would say that this is really a great opportunity for everybody from, from the RISC-V community to, to help the software move from, from the you know, poor, flawed, monolithic architecture to the microkernel multi-server architecture, get all the benefits that we know are there without the performance benefit. And a final note to it is thanks to, to some of my colleagues that, that have contributed uh, their ideas. And also, if you would like to practically work on this, we are opening a new R&D lab uh, in Dresden the lab will focus primarily on microkernel development, but we would like to have a very well-balanced mix between you know, basic research, which is this topic I have spoken about, and you know, let's say more practical stuff. And uh, we are starting from scratch. Uh, so we, will, we, we are like in a startup mode within, within a company. And since Huawei owns High Silicon, which is one of the ARM chip producers, we will actually be able to talk to the hardware guys and maybe there will be actual physical tangible results out of it. Thank you. And if there are any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Mm -hmm. Why are you not doing it yourself? I mean, we are we are trying to do it ourselves. Yes, I mean. Yes, that was that's. I mean, that's the summary of my talk. We can do it nowadays. Yeah. The, so the question is. Yeah, the, the question is, was why are we, aren't we doing it already, right? If I can rephrase it. Yeah, we are trying to do it right now because I think this is a very precise moment in time to do it. Thank you. Yes. Go ahead. I, I, I believe okay. we, we can manage.
basically analogous to what is seen in virtual uh, in, the, in the virtualization uh, uh, hardware enablement. So as far as I've seen, you use part of those mechanisms. So uh, wouldn't be a better selling point for you to say, okay, this can be used for microkernels, but can also be used for, for virtualization, and that would gain a lot more traction for, for designers. So the question is whether it wouldn't be helpful to rephrase those ideas and questions in terms of virtualization and, and stuff like that. Definitely it's possible because I, I believe there is essentially no difference between between the microkernel architecture or the microkernel and the hypervisor. I mean, most of the microkernels that are being used, you know, practically, SCL4, QNX, PyCoS, they also act as, as, a, as a hypervisor. So definitely, yeah, that would make sense. And we are doing the same in our company, actually. We're actually out of time. Okay, so let's talk afterwards. Thank you very much again.